great privilege to always give the Word of God. And that note, I'd ask you to turn with you, me and your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we'll be studying verses 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verses 16 through 18. If you would, I'd ask you to stand with me if you're able as we read God's Word. 2 So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transit, but the things that are unseen are are eternal. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for your blessed word, how true it speaks to our heart. And now we would ask that you would take it and by your spirit apply it to our hearts and lives. Open our eyes that we might see wondrous things from your wall. Is our prayer. And uh, Lord, we'd be careful to give you all the praise and glory and honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Might be seated. The major premise of this study, or as our pastor calls it, the big idea is this. A true Christian can face the circumstances of life without losing heart. Let me say it again for you. A true Christian can face the circumstances of life without losing heart. You'll notice verse, in verse 16 of our passage that Paul Paul begins by saying, so we do not lose heart. To lose heart would be to become discouraged, to become um, depressed and downhearted, to want to give up, throw up your hands. Um, and Paul makes a point of telling us that he himself does not lose heart. In verse 1 of this same chapter 4, Paul says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. The very same phrase we have in verse 16. Now, the ministry that Paul had been given by the Lord was a very difficult one, a very dangerous one, took a great toll on his physical life. But he would say that in all of that, he does not lose heart. And the reason, and he gives it here in that verse, is, uh, is because of the greatness of the ministry that had been given to him. He had been assigned by the Lord the gospel ministry, sharing by life and by word God's grace and mercy upon poor sinners and about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection and that sinners can find complete forgiveness of their sins and can be brought into a true and living relationship with God and can have their lives changed and have hope. And regardless of how difficulties, difficult things were, Paul said, I don't lose hope because of the ministry that God has given me is such a great and marvelous one. So he makes a point to tell us that he doesn't lose hope and we pray that we ourselves as Christians also not lose hope. It's a challenge. It was a challenge for Paul and it is a challenge for all of us as we face many circumstances in life that might cause us to lose heart. Two of them are listed in our passage of Scripture, and those are the ones that we're going to look at. You might have others you'd like to add, but we'll look at these two. The first one, found in verse 16, is the words, Our outer self is wasting away. Speaking of our physical bodies. As a result of the fall, the human body that God had made, made it good and right, and all it should be, yet since that time, the physical body has been deteriorating. It's been declining. It grows weaker and weaker as time goes by. Now, I'm going to use myself as an example here. Could have taken anyone over 50 and used you. It would have been just as well, but it's just easier to use myself. 
Um, okay, see this? <laughs> there was a time when I had a lot of hair, and it was black, not one bit of gray anywhere. Black hair. It was, I even could part it on the side. There was a time when I let it grow down over my ears even. And you say, what? but what's happened? The outer man is wasting away. There was a time when I didn't wear glasses. Didn't have them all. Over past 40 years of old. See, great. And then one day I noticed I couldn't re- see a road sign too clear. So I went to the eye doctor and he said, oh, yes, well, yes, got a problem. Your reading's great, but we'll make a little correction at the top. So I wore glasses. And it wasn't long. I went back again and he said, you know, your reading now is not so good. So we'll put a correction there and a little correction on top and on and on and goes. So that now I can't see far away or read without my glasses on. What's happened? The outward man is perishing. There was a time when I could run and jump. Um, This past week, we were in South Carolina. I took two of my grandsons from here, and we went to South Carolina to see cousins. And I have another grandson there, and we played a bit of basketball, and I could keep up with them shooting. But my South Carolina grandson, who's about my height and real curly hair, and anyway, he's pretty athletic, and, and uh, he ran and he jumped and he reached up and he touched that rim. I think he could have grabbed hold of it. He was about a pretty. And as soon as, he, as soon as he came down, all three grandsons looked at me and said, All right, Grandpa, can you do that? And all I could do is stand there and look at that goal and remember a time years and years and years ago when I could jump up and touch the rim, but not now. And never will again on this earth because the outward man is wasting away. But the inner man is renewed day by day. I was looking through some pictures the other day. I came across a picture of my high school graduation picture, my high school senior picture. And if we could take that picture and put it up on the screen, you would look at that and you'd look at me and you'd say, is that really you? And I'd have to say, well, I don't know. I think it is. Um, the outward man is wasting away. But the inner man, and see, this is why the Christian does not have to lose heart, although his outward man is perishing. You see, this, this thing of the decline of the human body really does bother a lot of people when they discover they don't look as good as they used to. And they can't do the things that they used to. And it causes them really to lose heart. And people do all kinds of things to try to fight that. They try to blot out the gray in their hair and um, remove wrinkles and excess fat from place, all kinds of things. And I'll tell you, dear friends, it's to no avail. (laughs) Because this thing of the outward self wasting away is a process. There's not any plateau in that. It just continues downward until one day you die. And from some of you dear loved one of young one folks here that I love so, you might look at me and say, yeah, he's an old man. Well, you're right. But if God gives you years, one day you'll be like this. You really will. But even in that, the Christian does not need to lose heart. And the reason, as our passage tells us, is that though the outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Our inner life, our spiritual life, although physically we may be declining, spiritually we don't have to decline. My wife and I had the great privilege and honor of helping Bill Hurd with some counseling. Uh, and it was an honor. And we went to those counseling times, uh, uh, actually, because of Linda's illness, he needed a woman to be there. And um, I got to, and my wife was, was good at that, and I got to tag along. It was a great time. Anyway, we found ourselves taking notes of everything that Bill had to say. And we listened with great attention to all of his applications of Scripture and tried to take it in. And, and although I'd been myself uh, at that type of thing for 40 years, I was learning. And it thrilled my heart 
Because even when you get old, you don't have to be put on the shelf. You can still learn. You can still grow in your spiritual life. Your, your walk with the Lord can be deepened. Isn't that a, I just thank God for that. Because we're all going to, God willing, we're all going to get to that point. And, and we can be increasing in our spiritual walk. Regardless of how our outward frame might be declining, inwardly we can still be growing and developing and renewed day by day. Johnny Erickson Tata said, you may be crippled, but you can still walk with the Lord. You may be blind, but you can still see the light. You may be deaf, but you can still hear the word of God. You may be mentally handicapped, but you can still have the mind of Christ. And Paul might add to that, you, your outer self may be wasting away, but the inner self is renewed day by day. So we thank God for that, for his great blessing that even in that we need not lose heart. Our second circumstance of life that Paul mentions that could cause a person to lose heart is found in verse 17. For a light momentary affliction is the word. Sometimes it is translated tribulation. The root meaning of the word is pressure. Uh, sometimes in its root it was used of a millstone going down on the grain and grinding and crushing. And it's just to say there are circumstances of life that can crush you and that can grind you. And these type of things can cause you to lose heart. Paul probably had in mind his own afflictions that he suffered in his ministry. But I think we can expand that a bit. A broken relationship. As some of you know very much about. Can be an affliction. Lose a job. Can be an affliction. To have your house burned down, as has happened to the parents of some of our family in our church. What a great affliction to lose everything you have. Lose a loved one in death. As the Hurt family can bear witness to us on every hand. Affliction. A disease can strike you. I have a dear friend, I was his pastor for 40 years in, or for 20 years in Texas, um, and he caught COVID. He and his wife both went to the hospital. They had a bad case. Uh, they went to the hospital, and it was a, really a battle. And he eventually uh, gathered some strength and came home. But his wife didn't fare as well. And there she remained, and he prayed so for her, he and his daughter who was there with him, and they prayed and prayed for nurses and anointed everything with oil that possibly they could in the hospital room and uh, called the church to pray, and, and even others they knew, like myself, out of town, and we prayed that the Lord would heal her and raise her up. But after 21 days, she died. Her funeral was Friday. 64 years old. And my, my friend told me, he said, it was the hardest thing I have ever done to give her up. An affliction. But a Christian does not have to lose heart in the midst of afflictions. And we, we look at the verse, verse 17, it says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The word preparing, the affliction, the affliction is preparing. In other words, it's at work. The word can be translated and is in some translation working, working things out. And we know that it is what, what that Paul means is it's God using afflictions. God is working there in the affliction to carry out his purposes on this earth and his purposes among his people. 
Of course, one of his great purposes is, uh, as Romans 8.29 tells us, is to conform us, his children, into the image of his Son, to make us like Christ, to make us everything a human being should be. And the very best thing for you or for me is that we might be all that God created us to be. And that's what God is working. And he uses afflictions and troubles and sufferings to add virtues to our life, to take away unwanted vices. Uh, Look at Romans chapter 5, if you would, verses 3 and 4. Paul says, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing That suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Psalm 119 verse 67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. See, there's a before, and then there's a now. Before the affliction, he had gone astray, drifted from the things of the Lord, but after the afflictions, but now what? He keeps it. The affliction made a difference in his life, a great difference in his life. And we might say with one of the old Puritans commenting on this very verse, many thousand renewed sinners may cry, oh, healthful sickness, oh, comfortable sorrow, oh, gainful loss. O oh, enriching poverty, O oh, blessed day, I was afflicted. Now, you can only say that when you see things from the proper perspective. Now, Paul says of his own afflictions, they are light and momentary afflictions. And We read about some of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. There the apostle Paul defending his apostleship from false apostles, but um, he has something to say about this. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. Are they, I am talking like a madman. Now, here he goes. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, lest one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, in dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brethren, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposed. Hardly seems like light affliction to me. And for as far as momentary, it lasted from the time of his conversion all the way to his death. A martyr's death, by the way. But he can only say that when he views these things in light of eternity. For his afflictions were momentary compared to eternity. Compared to eternity... They were, they were just like that compared to eternity. Compared to eternity, con- those great weight, those great or be light, his affliction will be light compared to the great weight of glory that awaited him. And those afflictions were working, God working, using them, preparing him, doing something in his life for a great weight of glory, an incomparable weight of glory. In other words, it makes a difference what you do now, how you live now, because how you live now has a lot to do with what eternity is like for you. Well, it's our prayer that by God's grace and with God's help, we might live like Christians 
in the midst of our afflictions, for they will come. Knowing that all this, all our suffering is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Now, there's some of you here today. This morning, you're in the midst of great affliction. You really are. And that's my prayer for you that in the suffering, however great it might be, that you do not lose heart. But know that God is at work. God's at work there for your benefit and for your good. And that these sufferings are preparing for you an eternal weight of glory. Eric Little, the great Scottish athlete of years gone by and missionary to China, said this, Circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. And he's not helpless among the ruins in your life either. Well, verse 18, here's what we are to do as Christians. We are to look the word look, the particular word used here, means to fix a gaze, to concentrate our attentions on. And we as Christians are to look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. And there's a reason given for the things that are seen are, are transient, they're temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now we do realize we live in a world where we have to be concerned about our job and focus attention there and about our home, we have to give you much attention there and about our automobile and about uh, our bills and about uh, knowing that God made us for recreation and he made us for entertainment and all those things. The point is focus. Yes, we have all these things to think about. They're part of our, but the point is our focus. And for a Christian, our focus is our major focus. The thing is not to be on those things, but to be on, in the spiritual realm. On our great God and the wonderful salvation he's provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. And all that God has done for us and his grace and his mercy and Knowing that one day we're going to have a resurrected body. Verse 14 of this same fourth chapter. Paul says, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up also with Jesus. And bring us with you into his presence. Now, let me just make a side note here. The word knowing, you can't really put your focus on something you don't know. And by knowing, I mean not only know it intellectually. Know it and believe it's true. And knowing that and believing this truth, set in your focus that one day we're going to have a resurrected body that's not going to have all these ills, not going to have all these handicaps. Uh, we won't have that. We have a new body, a new resurrected body, and to set our hearts on heaven. I was interested, the article I was reading uh, uh, gave a summary of John Calvin, the great reformer, of his summary of the Christian life. I was interested in that. It's, it's taken from his Institutes of the Christian Religion, a very thick book, but you, uh, very, uh, um, very helpful. But his summary was this for the Christian life. Deny yourself. Now, we, I didn't say we're going to like these. I'm just saying here's what he said. Deny yourself. Deny yourself so you could serve God. That's, deny yourself. Take up the cross. That's number two. The third one, and I, this was the one that surprised me. I wasn't surprised that he said the other two, but the third one is meditate on the future life. And to be quite honest, I don't do much meditation on the future life probably like I should. Jonathan Edwards has a little booklet. The pastor mentioned it a good while ago in one of his sermons. It's called Heaven, the World of Love. And I've read it. It's, I've it's actually a chapter of another book, but anyway, I read that. My heart was greatly warmed to think about going this for where there's so much love, not only 
God's love for us, which we do know, but we'll understand God's love for us and we'll have love for him and love for each other and it'll just be, I thought, oh, how wonderful. And I, uh, I like to read Pilgrim's Progress. I try to read uh, that great allegory by John Bunyan. I try to read it once a year, um, but I love to read it uh, and particularly the last part of it. When Christian, he's the main character in the allegory. He's left the city of destruction. He's gone through all of these troubles. It's a, it's, it's a picture of the Christian life, really. And he goes through all of these things and learns all these th- And eventually he comes to the river, which represents death. And he has to cross over. And when he crossed over, he was met by two shining beings, angelic beings, with some, and, they were, and they began to guide him up toward the celestial city where he was headed, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly home. And he was going there, this great city. He could see it in the distance. And as he went up, uh, the king sent out trumpeters, his trumpeters to come and, and blow the trumpets of welcome. And a great heavenly host came out around and surrounded him all around as they walked up to the gate. And he came to the gate of the city, and uh, uh, someone said, call out, and he did. And all of a sudden, these heads pop up. There's Enoch, and Elijah, and Moses, and several, and it says, etc. All these people look over uh, and um, ask him why he, he was coming, and he, he did the things that were necessary on that. And um, the doors began to open, and the bells of the city rang, and there were great shouting and praises. And as he was going through, he was transformed and given a robe that glowed like gold and a harp to praise and a crown for honor. And in he went, and there was a... And I just thought, I want to go there. <laughs> I would mentioned Johnny Erickson Tata. She's one of my heroes of the faith. A young girl of 17 dived into the Chesapeake Bay, hit her head, and was paralyzed. A paraplegic, never again to move her on this life, to move her hands or her feet. But God, through the midst of great suffering and struggles and doubts and fears and losing hard time and again, um, she's become a very powerful Christian woman with a tremendous ministry to handicapped people. And she can draw. And you say, now wait a minute. I thought you said she couldn't move her hands. And her, well, she puts a pencil in her mouth. And she can write like that. And draw. And I've seen pictures of her drawings. And I'm amazed at me of someone who draws stick figures. That how she could draw such a, a wonderful drawings that she does. And I was just, it's amazing. With it in her mouth. I don't know how she did it. But anyway, uh, my, my favorite drawing that she did was a very simple one. It was a drawing of her wheelchair with a sign for sale. She's looking for the life to come. Although her afflictions, and we wouldn't call them light, were working for her far more exceeding. She's looking, setting her focus, not on the things that are seen, Things that are unseen. Well, in in conclusion, I want to return to our big idea. I said, the true Christian, the genuine Christian. You see, everybody who claims to be a Christian isn't one. Being a Christian is a lot more than saying that you're a Christian. To be a true Christian, God has to do a work in your heart and in your life. And you know it that he does. And you have to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trusting in him, what he did on the cross, he's God's salvation for us. And we have to trust and depend and cast our lives upon him. And some of you, I know some of you, Maybe younger people that you just feel like you're a Christian because you go to church and your parents just say, and that's not right. And the question I ask, have you really put your trust in the Lord Jesus today? The true Christian can, that's the next word, 
can face life, the circumstances of life without losing heart. Can. That doesn't mean they always do. Now, maybe all of us from time to time become discouraged and downhearted, as, but we hopefully we right ourselves right away and not lose heart in any length of time. But you can. You can be so caught up in the things of the world. Get your focus so off of the Lord and what he, who He is and all these promises. You can get so focused there that when something happens, some circumstance of life happens, And my prayer for you today is that you would not lose your focus on the Lord. You'd set it firmly there on who He is, what He's done, what awaits you as a child. You keep your focus there. Because tribulations and aging and all these things and more will happen to you. But oh, by God's grace, you not lose heart. Look to the Lord. Let him be your help and your stay in these times. Let's bow together for prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your precious word and the truths that are there. We're thankful, God, for the mercies that you give us, for the wonderful salvation that we have in Christ, and for the hope that you've given us, Lord, in the midst of this world that is in such difficulties. Um, Lord, we have a hope and a confidence in you, knowing that whatever our circumstances are, you are at work molding and shaping and forming and carrying out your purposes. And we are so extremely thankful and grateful for that. And Lord, today we bless your name. I pray for some indeed who, in the midst of tribulation even now, Lord, may you strengthen them and help them and be with them. Help us all as we face these times of life, a very difficult time we live in. Lord, we'd not lose heart in any of this. We'd not complain or whine. We'd just set our heart on you. Live like, live like Christians to your glory and your honor. And we pray, Lord, this day you might be honored in it all. For we pray it in Jesus' name.